A single national federation, the CTC, the Central de Trabajadores de Cuba, uh, which has been in existence continuously since 1939. In other words, Cuba's had a united trade union federation uh, since long before uh, the revolution. Cuba's unions are organized industrially or sectorially. There's a health workers union, an education workers union, and so on. Um, Cuba's unions are legally independent. They are subject, as far as I'm aware, to only one legal constraint, which is something worth thinking about if you're a British trade unionist. And that one legal constraint is that their statutes must have been agreed democratically by their members. Okay? Now, even the requirement that they elect their representatives uh, was removed from the law after the International Labour Organization uh, complained that an insistence on internal democracy was an interference by the state in Cuban <laughs> Union's internal affairs. So it took it out, but they do it anyway. <laughs> the Cuba's unions are funded entirely out of the subscriptions of their members, which are paid voluntarily, and they are paid in cash. For various historical reasons, there's no check-off uh, by employers, so it's hard work collecting uh, subs, and that's what the unions uh, depend upon. They have until recently enjoyed uh, 90% plus representation on that voluntary basis. And I say until recently, because obviously, uh, as we'll, I'll be talking about a little bit, the expansion of the private sector has challenged the unions really uh, to recruit in that area, uh, in which now a substantial proportion of the workforce is located. They have great power. They're the principal mass organization in Cuba, in Cuban civil society. They are partners in policy making, they are partners in law making. They have a constitutional right to propose laws and be consulted on laws. And they have, in effect, a de facto uh, veto on employment legislation. At least that's how it was put to me by a Labour minister, uh, a Labour ministry lawyer a couple of years ago. It's the unions that organise the mass consultations on the party guidelines, on the, uh, the Labour code of legislation. They organise tens of thousands of meetings, coordinate the responses, organize them, write them up, and present them uh, to uh, the government. Uh, and that has resulted in a great many changes to proposals, which I could go into if I had more time. They have a great deal of workplace power. Again, I can't go into the massive platform of rights that workers and unions enjoy in Cuba, but let me mention one or two things. Uh, that might mean something to trade unionists here, apart obviously from recognition. Trade unions have automatic right to facility time, to offices, to training time. Agreement of the unions locally is required to the pattern of the working day, to any layoffs, to any rest or uh, holiday working. Uh, they sit on the company boards and they negotiate the uh, legally obliged, this is an obligation on the employers, uh, there's an obligation to conclude a collective bargaining agreement with Cuban trade unions in every workplace that is binding in law. And that bargaining agreement, having been negotiated by the unions, has to be approved by the workers in their assembly. There has to be a majority vote on a 70% turnout. Please don't tell the Conservative government <laughs> in Cuba you have to have a 70% turnout. But these are workplace meetings, not postal ballots, remember. Also, uh, they sit on the grievance and disciplinary panels. Again, if you're a trade unionist, think about this. Disciplinary and grievance issues in Cuba are dealt with by workplace panels where there's automatic union recognition, but better than that, the majority of the people who sit on the panels are elected workers from that workplace. So that's just a little insight, really, into the belt and braces protection uh, that the unions have. Of course, as is often pointed out, they perform a dual role uh, in Cuban society of both defending and advancing the revolution and its policies and defending within that the interests of workers. This is, after all, constitutionally a, quote, socialist state of workers, right? What are the main features of the updating the impact on the workforce and unions? First of all, salaries. Uh, Ralph Castro's first set-piece speech included what at the time was seen as an astonishing statement, although it came to no surprise to any Cubans, and his statement was that he recognised that Cuban salaries after 20 or five 
years of mayhem after the collapse of the Soviet Union were not adequate for a decent life. <clears throat> and that people had to do other things which involved fiddle work and so on and so forth. And that a priority of the changes that were going to come about in Cuba would be to restore the value of salaries to a level that people would live a decent life on. Cuban economists have calculated that in 2008, the purchasing power of uh, salaries was about 28% of what it was in the year before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So even after the Cuban economy has recovered its national income, the problems of, uh, of, uh, of spending power have, have persisted, and since then have got worse because of price inflation and various other factors. Okay, I'll say a bit more about that. So, but the principal instrument, apart from the health sectors, had big increases, triplings in their official salaries. The big increases are supposed to come from payment by results systems, which underpin what they call the socialist principle of distribution, that people's income from work depends on the contribution they make at work. The second area is the restructuring from 2010 of the labour force. You'll have heard about the government announcing and the unions endorsing the, uh, the movement of half a million of workers from uh, unnecessary or inflated payrolls in the state sector, principally into uh, self-employment with, with hundreds of categories of self-employment legalised at the time. And we're doing for time. Yeah, yeah, not quite, yes. Okay. Um, the target actually was to get a million workers out of the state sector eventually, but initially, over a three month period, uh, they were supposed to be moving half a million. And changing the attitude of the Cuban society towards the self employed from one where they were regarded as a fifth column of petty bourgeois uh, money grubbers to workers providing services for Cubans that they might not <coughs> otherwise not have access to. Mm. Thirdly, in 2011, the party guidelines were agreed uh, that have launched the complex process of updating of the Cuban economy, reforming the, they don't use the word reform because it has an unfortunate history in the history of socialism, it's about updating, but it is a package of reforms, of which the most important for me for this purpose is that managerial authority is being decentralized from the ministries into the state companies. Uh, and those state companies are being subjected to tests of profitability and the possibility of bankruptcy. Fourthly, uh, Cuba has legislated the introduction of non-agricultural co cooperatives, the preferred form of non-state economic activity, but so far relatively slow progress, about 20,000 co-op members in about 400 co-ops. So, but this is regarded now as a socialist form of, uh, of economic organisation. And finally, last year Cuba introduced a new foreign investment law and launched a process of inviting uh, foreign investors to, to form mixed companies uh, and for that purpose they've introduced uh, actually more generous tax regime and profit re rehabilitate, uh, repatriation scheme than previously existed. So what are the challenges? I want to mention three things quickly. Salaries is a massive challenge. Nobody in Cuba believes that the revolution can survive indefinitely if people can't live a decent life on their salaries and abandon all the fiddle work and pilfering that they have to do to get by. But no general increases are impossible, are possible in present economic circumstances. So the principal means is productivity pay. In practice that's proved very difficult. If you read the letters page of the weekly workers paper to Abacadores, it's full of complaints about the failure to properly implement the opportunities for performance related play. The other thing that's happened though, with that decentralisation of authority to state enterprises, is that the uh, negotiation and management of productivity payment schemes and of annual company bonus systems has been de decentralised to uh, companies. And that means that the issue, the constitutional right in Cuba to equal pay for equal work, requires a new kind of trade union attention because national salary scales, the national salary scale, now forms only the base of people's salaries. Uh, bonuses, of course, depend on many factors independent of a worker's efforts, 
under the socialist principle of distribution, under which you get paid according to your contribution and equal pay, the skill of the union negotiating the local deals, the profitability of the company, whether the worker is in the public sector or, in the, or is a, an employee in the private sector, uh, the national minimum now, national minimum wage is different in the foreign investment sector. In other words, the diversification of salary systems poses question marks over that constitutional equal pay position, which comes from an era of centralised, almost 100% nationalised activity. Secondly, the creation of a large private sector uh, has makes big challenges now to the unions. The unions have promoted this big change, it's done the political damage. The point was made explicitly in the report to the CTC's annual congress last year that the cost of the unions, and I'll read you the quote, uh, one minute, that uh, our support for the labour restructuring uh, ensured the processes and conditions did not generate conflicts or incidents of political character, but the application of these decisions have come at a political cost to our organisation. Unions are trying to uh, recruit in the private sector, they have about 40%, but we're talking now about a third of the 500,000 registered self-employed workers who are registered as contracted labourers, who are employed by other Cubans. The unions have protected their status as workers after a long battle in which the ministry wanted them to be uh, civil contractors. Again, many trade unions would be familiar with this phony distinction, but the unions have won that along with the labour lawyers. Those workers are in, in uh, employment in sometimes with 200 private employees. They are entitled to a collective bargaining agreement. They are entitled to workers' participation, but it's not yet happening. That's a big challenge for the unions. Finally, Cubans have, in their constitution, uh, not merely the right to be uh, protected from exploitation of man by man, which private employment uh, generates the possibility of, uh, and to equal pay, they have the right to work. And the system has, the, the reforms have changed the form in which that is offered to Cuban citizens. It's no longer the guarantee of a job provided by the state, it's the state providing opportunities to work in the private sector as well as in the state. Uh, and uh, earnings related unemployment benefit now only lasts for six months. So the responsibility of individual Cubans to seek work, to activate the right to work, is now much more prominent than it was before. And that is also a challenge uh, to the unions. So finally, many new challenges, balancing change and supporting change with defending workers' rights. The unions are very uh, conscious of all this and they're having to change the nature of their organisation and their training uh, to cope with it because if the trade unions cannot play their part in sustaining the legitimacy of the revolution and the changes it's trying to make, then it will become vulnerable to the attempts explicit and made on December the 17th by Obama explicitly in his speech that the United States will seek to form breakaway unions in Cuba, especially in the private sector. There's a big challenge there for the unions and they still need our support in achieving all of that. And of course, it goes without saying, if the blockade was lifted, all of this would be infinitely easier for them to achieve. Thank you.